The Rams edge the Chargers at one cringy afternoon at SoFi. Tyler Glasnow tries to reassure Dodger fans that his elbow is still attached. And if you thought USC football didn't impress the scribes, well, the individual players don't impress them much either. Good morning. I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is the Faithful Angelino's Morning Report. So it's August 18th, 2024. Welcome back to the Sanctum Sanctorum of LA Sports. It's also Sunday, the Lord's Day. If you believe as I do, take a moment. Thank him for the blessings you have in your life, like LA Sports. And if you'd like being in the know about LA, click the clack the like button. Click the clack the subscribe button. There's a notification bell. Hit that, it'll let you know when we drop new content. Sharing is caring, let people know we exist, and by all means comment. We have an expanded look at the scoreboard today because there's a lot to talk about. St. Louis 5, Dodgers 2. Shohei Otani hit his 38th home run of the year, but he also stole two bases. He's at 37. Closing in on becoming the first Dodger to reach the 40-40 plateau. It's only been accomplished five times in Major League history. But more than that, Otani's on a pace to go 45-45 which would top everybody. Bobby Miller in his return from AAA though, didn't give him much of a chance to win. Four earned runs, four and two thirds innings. Rams 13, Chargers nine. I'm sure at least one idiot on TV called it the battle for LA. 13-9 isn't a battle, it's a slap fight. And not even one with those muscle headed goons that Dana White likes. Neither quarterback acquitted himself well. Once again, Stetson Bennett won the game, but that's a, a t with a touchdown pass in the fourth quarter against the last guys on the Charger bench. What are we talking about? Meanwhile, the Bolts are one of two NFL teams that have not scored an offensive touchdown in the preseason. What makes this afternoon so cringe is that we have learned just how precarious both teams really are. They can't rely on their quarterback depth. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. LAFC Seattle 0. Dennis Buanga, Kai Kamara, and Dennis Hollingshead all score. The black and gold advance to the semifinals of League's Cup. They will face Colorado. Chicago 90, Sparks 86. The Sparks are 6 and 20. The less said, the better. Meanwhile, today, the Dodgers are at St. Louis at 11. Clayton Kershaw is 1 and 2 with a 3.50 ERA. Sonny Gray, 11 and 7, 3.93 ERA. The Sparks are at Las Vegas today at 3. Meh. And Juarez is at Angel City at 7 o'clock. It's a friendly. Let's start with the Chargers, right? I mean, look, just a couple of days ago, if you want to start with optimism, Justin Herbert was finally seen without a walking boot. This is the result of an issue with his plantar fascia, which is a uh, tendon that connects the heel to the balls of your feet. Jim Harbaugh was purposefully vague when he removed the belt, uh, the boot, saying that Herbert was on track. He just couldn't say on track for what. You would think it would be on track to start the season, but he couldn't even confirm that at that point. Even when he was pressed by the scribes, I'm assuming that there was a communication lapse with the medical team. So you could breathe a little easier if you're a Chargers fan. He is on track to start the regular season, which would be against the Raiders, a team with its own quarterback problems, the season opener is September 8th. Herbert was seen in street clothes at SoFi Stadium on the turf, throwing to receivers before the game. He did not use his legs though in the sense of like, oh, I'm gonna drop back to pass or whatever. So they're still taking it easy on him. As for Stick, who committed multiple turnovers yet again, and he left Saturday's game with a quarterback rating of 48.6, there are Chargers bloggers out there suggesting he is the prime candidate to get cut. Now Harbaugh later on told the LA Daily News there are not plans to change the quarterback room. Quote, we have one of the best starting quarterbacks in the world, and the next quarterback would be under the same expectations, whether Justin was there or wasn't there. If he wasn't playing in these last two games, we still want to see the same improvement, the same type of performance, unquote. And yet common sense makes you wonder otherwise. 
Last year, when the Chargers got absolutely embarrassed up in Las Vegas, I was at that game. And to be clear, there were way more problems that the Chargers had that night than Easton Stick. That game was so bad, Brandon Staley got fired the next day, if you recall. But you have to look at what's been going on and say, isn't Stick regressing? Receding? Worse than my hair? The Chargers have one more preseason game. Obviously, Stick is going to play that one. We'll see if the Chargers coaching staff can stomach that performance as well. Meanwhile, as per usual, the Rams did not play much of their starters, so the fans were left parsing through the backups, kind of like a, the bin of $3 DVDs at Walmart, wondering if any of them can make the cut. So take none of what I'm about to say as a prediction. I've seen way too many players just dominate in the preseason and not make the team. But safety Jalen McCulloch led the Rams in tackles in week one of preseason, and yesterday he picked off stick. Also, linebacker Jake Hummel listed as fourth on the depth chart. He forced stick to fumble. Now you figure that with Ernest Jones's battle against a bulky knee, Hummel should have a gig locked down? Maybe? Perhaps? I will say this, the Rams defense has yet to allow a touchdown in the preseason. So maybe new defensive coordinator Chris Shula has a thought or two in his head, or at least knows how to communicate those thoughts to the players. Maybe the Rams can breathe easy a little on defense, at least in terms of what's going on in the mind of the coaching staff. I'm also aware wide receiver Jordan Whittington, who is a sixth round draft pick. He has caught 11 passes over two preseason games. Multiple Rams bloggers are calling their shot. He's made the team. He's made the team. Well, it's very possible that he's made the team. Very much so. Most teams carry six wide receivers though. And so you're left wondering how many shots does this guy have to make the roster? We know who the top three Rams receivers are, right? We know who the starting three is. And then you're saying, well, okay, we'll throw in 2-2 Atwell in there. That means the question is, does Jordan Whittington get one of those final two spots? We spent a lot of time in yesterday's clip breaking down why we should not be too concerned over Tyler Glass now's second trip to the injured list this year. And the pitcher confirmed all those things yesterday afternoon talking with the scribes. He said sometimes his elbow just gets sore in the aftermath of Tommy John surgery. Even though that surgery was back in 2021. Quote, there's just like tightness within that because they kind of double looped the ligament in there. And for a while, there's going to be a little bit of space created. So there's going to be some tightness. And that's kind of all it felt like. It's a similar feeling. You know what I mean? Unquote. For the record, I have no idea what you mean. Never had Tommy John surgery, but we'll continue. Quote, it's just from post-op stuff. So it was nothing super concerning to me. I feel fine now. I think that's the most frustrating thing, unquote. So yeah, 15 days to rest it up. Why do you want to risk somebody else blasting out their elbow right before the uh, postseason begins? Reliever Ryan Brazier was activated from AAA. He was on a rehab assignment due to a right calf strain. He pitched Saturday. It was his first major league action since April. Now to make room for both him and Miller, the Dodgers sent down Michael Grove and Justin Robleski. ESPN listed its top 100 college football players of the season. Two Trojans made the cut. But I'm going to go into detail a little bit about it, and that's not going to make you feel all that high-spirited about the Trojans, at least what the national scribes think of them. Zachariah Branch is the highest-rated USC player at 78. 
Miller Moss checks in at number 71. Consider last year. The Trojans were bringing back a Heisman Trophy winner, among others. Now, Branch is on the list, and that sounds great because he's a sophomore, and you're sitting there going, wait, that means there's a lot of room for improvement. He could change the course of a game anytime he returns a kick. But then you wonder, is he a little overrated? because they are only hoping right now that he can match that explosiveness as a wide receiver, and he has yet to prove that on a regular basis as a receiver. Touchdowns with kickoffs and punts? Sure. But that's not exactly one-third of the game there, guys. Meanwhile, Moss is one of 18 quarterbacks to make the list, but he's 15th ranked among those quarterbacks. Moreover, and I'm not suggesting you put a lot of stock in those lists. I'm not. I'm simply trying to give you as complete a picture of USC football as possible because there's a lot of optimism going on in Trojans camp. I'm basically saying, I'm not trying to tell you USC is going to suck. I'm trying to tell you we have reasons for optimism, but let's temper that with some other stuff so we don't go drinking too much opium. If you do not, if you put a lot of stock in these lists, know that multiple teams have way more than two players on it. Ohio State has seven players on that list. Two teams that USC will face this year have five players on the list. That would be Michigan and Notre Dame. Now the following is just rampant speculation. I'm just thinking about this out loud. Are you a Kings fan like I am? If you are, you likely spend nights staring at the wall, wondering how they could have possibly squandered the best group of prospects in, the, in hockey. How the hell did they do that? Consider this as a reason. I'm not saying I'm right. Consider it. They wanted grit so bad that scoring goals became an afterthought. I remember when the Kings were starting to rebuild after they tore it down, they could pass very well, but they were getting out hit in virtually every game. Out hit. The, cha the, the two teams for the Kings that won the Stanley Cup played the heavy game. They beat on you until you submitted, right? So there you are thinking, well, wait a second, we got to score goals too. Does that mean the prospects that do score get held to a standard that they can't possibly meet because they don't hit everybody? Like you could snipe goals from anywhere on the ice and Rob Blake is still saying, yeah, but what about his forecheck? When was the last truly great Kings third goal scorer? Not the leader, the guy coming in second, third, and fourth. Sure, Adrian Kempe led the Kings with 41 two years ago. You had to account for him. But I'm talking about having a team where you have to account for multiple guys not dropping a hat trick on you. Besides, the Kings scoring went straight to hell last year because they were trying so hard to pursue grit. Only one Kings player topped 30 goals last year. That was Trevor Moore. The Oilers' Connor McDavid was third on his team, and yet he scored more goals than the Kings' top scorer. Florida won the Stanley Cup, as you know. Sam Reinhardt scored 57 goals. Now, I'm not trying to say that I know prospect Samuel Fajimo or Arthur Kaliev are the solution to all the Kings' problems. I'm not saying that, but I do know this. In the offseason, after the Kings were yet again eliminated in the first round, the Kings doubled down once again on grit in the offseason by signing Warren, Warren Fogle and Tanner Janot. Grit over goals. Is that the Kings' problem? This relentless pursuit of grit. The LA Galaxy have loaned forward Aaron Beboot to USL club FC Tulsa for the remainder of the season. Longtime viewers of the program know that I posted clips for this program on the road out in Tulsa, Oklahoma. 
So for B-Boot, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry you have to go there. And it's not just because you're going to Oklahoma, sir, but there are not many things that Tulsa is known for. You know what one thing Tulsa is known for? The Tulsa Race Massacre. Yeah. And if you're a historian, you might say, well, James, that's not fair. The Tulsa Race Massacre happened back in 1921, which is true. But AP reported just last night that they uncovered the remains of three more victims from the Tulsa Race Massacre. I wouldn't be all that comfortable if I were not white going to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm not that comfortable going there and I was and I am white. But you let me know what you think of the comments thread. Are you okay with the Rams and Chargers depth through two weeks of preseason? Are you breathing a sigh of relief over Tyler Glass now, not needing surgery? And if you enjoyed the content, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We're talking LA sports every single day here. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back tomorrow. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Porto El Queso production. Take care.